Aristotle's On Interpretation, Chapters 1-4, through four, According to the Thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. Let's begin with some basic facts about this book by Aristotle. The title of Aristotle's book is On Interpretation. This is a translation of Aristotle's Greek title, Perihermeneas. The Latin title for this book is De Interpretatione, or the transliterated Greek title, Perihermeneas. An interpretation for Aristotle is just a meaningful vocal sound, so this book is going to be a study of meaningful vocal sounds. In particular, it will be a study of a certain species of meaningful vocal sound, namely enunciative speech. In this video, we're going to discuss what is enunciative speech. St. Thomas Aquinas commented on Aristotle's book in depth. Aquinas' commentary is broken up into lessons, or lectures. First, Aquinas will quote a large section from Aristotle's book, and then he'll give a lesson or lecture in which he comments on what Aristotle is doing in that section. Aquinas makes frequent reference to previous authors who have already commented on Aristotle's book in the preceding centuries. Aquinas usually brings up the opinions of these authors in order to criticize them, but every once in a while he actually agrees with them. Some of the previous authors you'll notice that Aquinas mentions are Boethius, Ammonius, Alexander of Aphrodisias, and Porphyry. One of the most important things to understand in philosophy is spoken words. Spoken words are not spoken aimlessly, but instead they're spoken because the one speaking them has a certain idea, or concept, which Aristotle calls, somewhat awkwardly, a passion of the soul. Now, what's the relationship between a spoken word and the concept that leads us to speak the word? Well, we speak the word in order to signify the concept we have in our mind. Since the concept is invisible, we need some sort of sensible way of communicating that concept to other people who aren't already inside our mind. And so, we speak. Spoken word is just a bunch of sound waves which signifies the concept in our mind. The concept is invisible, but the sound waves are things that other people can come in contact with, and by them, they can come to know the concept in our mind. That's what it means to say that the spoken word signifies concepts or passions of the soul. But these passions of the soul are things which themselves are likenesses of things. In other words, the passions of the soul or concepts are ideas which we've picked up from seeing or perceiving things outside our mind. And so we say that the concepts in the soul are likenesses of, or reflections of, or resemble things outside the mind. Now what's the difference between a spoken word and a written word? Well, first and foremost, spoken words are sound waves, whereas written words are ink blotches or shapes on a page. More importantly, written words signify spoken words. In other words, written words only signify concepts indirectly, whereas spoken words signify concepts directly. Written words, first and foremost, tell us how to make a certain sound, and then from imagining that sound, or actually making the sound, we come to know a certain concept. Thus, written words signify spoken words, spoken words signify concepts in the mind, and concepts in the mind are the likeness of or reflection of things. We don't say that concepts signify things because concepts are actually similar to the things which they're concepts of. In contrast, words are not at all similar to the things that they signify. For instance, the word tree doesn't at all resemble an actual tree. Nevertheless, the word tree signifies the concept we have of a tree, which, if that concept is any good, ought to resemble an actual tree. 
We also need to distinguish between grammar and logic, which are distinct liberal arts or disciplines. In order to do this, we should quickly summarize what we established on the previous slide. Written symbols signify spoken symbols, spoken symbols signify concepts, and concepts resemble things. Now, logic is an art aimed at helping us to think correctly. Thus, the goal of logic is to organize and order concepts. But, concepts are invisible, and therefore very difficult to study directly. Instead, we study concepts indirectly by first studying spoken symbols which signify concepts. So, logic is directed at studying spoken symbols insofar as they signify concepts. The reason that spoken symbols, or sounds, are more easy to study than concepts directly is because sounds are things that are sensible, things with which we could actually come in contact. Thus, logic studies spoken symbols, or sounds. Grammar is an art aimed at helping us to communicate correctly. Grammar studies written symbols insofar as these signify sounds, which in turn signify concepts. Thus, grammar is both more fundamental than logic, as well as less important for philosophy. Logic is more proximate to philosophy because it studies something, namely sounds, which are more proximate to concepts, and philosophy is concerned with things which are reflected in concepts. Now that we've distinguished between logic and grammar, let's distinguish the different kinds of sounds, since that is what logic studies. Sounds are either vocal sounds, which are sounds that proceed from the throat and lungs, or non-vocal sounds. These are sounds that do not proceed from the throat and lungs. Examples are drum beats and the blowing of the wind. Vocal sounds are subdivided into insignificant vocal sounds like snoring, coughing, and nonsense words like bildress, and significant vocal sounds, that is, vocal sounds which actually signify some concept or passion of the soul. Significant vocal sounds are divided into naturally significant vocal sounds and conventionally significant vocal sounds. Naturally significant vocal sounds are those like a dog bark or a moan of pain or a bird song, which have significance by nature. They are meaningful to every member of the same species. All birds in the same species understand the same songs. All dogs understand barking. And all humans understand what a moan of pain means. These are usually only about things that are present, both in time and place, and they're usually only ordered to communicating with someone or something that is present both in time and place. In contrast, conventionally significant vocal sounds differ among members of the same species. For instance, French is a language that has conventionally significant vocal sounds and then therefore is not understood by people who only speak Spanish or English. Conventionally significant vocal sounds are sometimes about things which are present in time and place, but they can be about things which are not present in time and place. They can also be ordered to communicating with people who are not present in time and place. For instance, I can write down a book and then that can communicate to someone at distant centuries. That is because the symbols in a book communicate vocal sounds which are only conventionally significant. Now conventionally significant vocal sounds are subdivided into speech, which in Latin is called oratio, and words, which in Latin are called dixio. Speech is a conventionally significant vocal sound, some part of which signifies separately. This includes complete sentences, or independent clauses, and incomplete sentences, or dependent clauses, as well as phrases. Here are some examples of speech. Socrates thinks. That's a complete sentence. Fat dog. That's an incomplete sentence or phrase. Who are you? That's a complete sentence as well. If Socrates thinks, 
That's an incomplete sentence. All of these are examples of speech or oratio. Now, words, in contrast with speech, are conventionally significant vocal sounds that have no part which signify separately. This includes both compound and simple words. For instance, dog, red, dehydrates, hits, cannonball, foul. All of these are words or dixio. Let's take a quick digression into the difference between simple and compound words and into the problem of why these do not contradict the definition of speech given above. There are actually two problems. The first problem is this. Why is it that foul is not an example of speech since it has some part, namely the sound owl, which seems to signify separately? Namely, it signifies an animal, an owl. Since foul seems to have a part that signifies separately, it would seem that foul is speech and not a word. But obviously foul is a word, not speech, and therefore Aristotle's definition of speech seems to be wrong. Here's a similar but different problem. Why is it that cannonball is not speech, since both cannon and ball signify separately? Cannon signifies a military weapon, and ball signifies a round object. So cannonball seems to have parts which signify separately. Therefore, cannonball seems to meet the definition of speech, even though cannonball is not speech but a word. So once again, it would seem that Aristotle's definition of speech is incorrect. Here's Aquinas' solution to these two problems. Let's begin with his solution to the first problem. He solves the first problem by distinguishing between the significance of sound on its own and the significance of sound as part of a word. So while it might be true that owl as a sound on its own signifies a certain thing, namely an animal, this sound does not signify anything as part of the word foul. It's not the case that part of the word foul is the significance of an animal that lives only at night. And so, it's not the case that foul has some part which signifies separately, and therefore foul does not actually meet Aristotle's definition of speech, and therefore we should have no qualm saying that foul is a word, not speech. Aquinas' solution to the second problem is this. He distinguishes between sound, what sound signifies, and the reason for which that sound was chosen to be part of a word. So let's look at the example cannonball. The sound of the word cannonball is three syllables, cannonball. Now, these three syllables in part sound like two distinct words, cannon and ball. If those words were on their own or those sounds were on their own, they would signify two things, a cannon and a ball. But as parts of the word cannonball, they don't signify anything but one thing namely, the ball that is shot out of a cannon as a projectile. It's not the case that the sound cannon ball, as one word, signifies multiple things, namely, a cannon and a ball. Otherwise, when we said the cannon ball was shot out of the cannon, that would imply that a cannon and a ball were shot out of a cannon, which is obviously absurd. Nevertheless, cannonball is a complex word insofar as the reason for which those sounds were chosen was from two things, namely a cannon and a ball. So because a cannonball is a sort of ball which is related to a cannon, the person who chose the word cannonball to designate a cannonball did so in light of two distinct objects, namely a cannon and a ball. He was naming a ball by its relation to another object, namely a cannon. So the reason for which a compound word is named is complex. Nevertheless, just like simple words, complex words only signify or name one thing. Cannonball names a ball. Fowl names a sort of animal. So simple words and complex words are the same in the respect that they 
signify only one thing, but they differ in the reason for which the sound for that word was chosen. Still, what's important to note is that cannonball, since it signifies only one thing, does not have parts which signify separately. Like fowl and the part owl, the part of cannonball, cannon, does not signify anything as part of the word cannonball. It doesn't signify a weapon as part of the word cannonball. Therefore, cannonball, like fowl, does not meet the definition of speech given above. And therefore, we should have no qualm in saying that cannonball is a word and not speech. Therefore, the two objections to Aristotle's definition of speech fail. Now that we've shown Aristotle's definition of speech and word was appropriate, and is not contradicted by the existence of compound words, let's subdivide word into its different species. Now, word, as we said before, is a conventionally significant vocal sound, no part of which signifies separately. The first species of word is verb, or in Latin, verbum. This is a word that signifies with time and which is a sign of something said of something. What do these two characteristics mean? Well, the fact that a verb signifies with time means that it has tense. So, for example, we can tense a verb as being past tense, present tense, or future tense. Now, the reason we can do that is because verbs signify in the mode of action or motion or passion. That means that they indicate something flowing from a subject or inhering in a subject with motion. And since motion is measured by time, we can tense a verb as either past, present, or future. Now the second characteristic of verbs that we just mentioned is that they are a sign of something said of something. What this means is that all verbs imply predication. When we say is, or runs, or dehydrates, we want to know what subject is, what thing runs, what thing dehydrates. Verbs are always signs of predication, that is, they're signs of something said of something. A verb, in the strict sense of the word, does not include infinitive verbs like to run and to be. This is clear because infinitive verbs like to run and to be can be either the subject or the predicate of a sentence, whereas verbs must be the predicate of a sentence because they're always signs of something said of something else. But we could have a sentence like to run is to move, in such a sentence, an infinitive verb is the subject of a sentence, not the predicate. And therefore, infinitive verbs are not, strictly speaking, verbs. But th since they're related to verbs and derived from verbs, we use the word verb to describe infinitives, even though, strictly speaking, they're not verbs. Here are some examples of real verbs. Dehydrates, runs, is. The polar opposite of a verb, or the contrary of a verb, is a name, or in Latin, nomen. This is a word that signifies without time, that is, without tense, and which is not a sign of something said of something, that is, which is not a sign of being predicated of something, or which doesn't imply predication. Name in Aquinas' sense of that word, includes both nouns and adjectives. Here are some examples of a name. Dog, red, cannonball. Now, every once in a while, you'll catch Aristotle and Aquinas using the word name to describe both names and verbs, and in fact, all words at all. Although the word name can be used in this broad or derivative sense. Strictly speaking, the word name is contrasted with verb 
and does not include verb. Now, what's in between names and verbs is the participle. The participle is called a participle, or participium, precisely because it takes part of the name and part of the verb. It participates the nature of a name and participates the nature of a verb. A participle is a word that signifies with time like the verb, but unlike the verb and like the name, is not a sign of something said of something. That means participles like names can be either the subject or the predicate of a sentence, whereas verbs must be the predicate of a sentence. Here are some examples of participles, burning, running, being. Let's take a quick digression into other kinds of words which aren't names, verbs, or participles. You might be wondering why we haven't said anything about conjunctions and prepositions. Conjunctions such as and, but, or, and prepositions such as to, from, by, through, are not significant vocal sounds in themselves. Instead, they are only relatively significant. Thus, they aren't words absolutely speaking, but only relatively, or by analogy. In ordinary, everyday English, it's perfectly okay to refer to and, but, or, to, from, by, through, as words. Nevertheless, it's important to keep in mind that they're only words by analogy. The way they signify is not absolutely, but instead relatively. They signify by relating absolutely significant words to one another. Something similar can be said about infinite names and verbs. Here are some examples of infinite names and verbs. Non-man, non-seeing, non-runs. These do not signify any determinate concept. Instead, all they determine is what is not signified. For instance, non-man doesn't signify anything determinate. It could signify a cactus, or a tree, or a cup, or a dog, or a woman. Non-man only determines what it doesn't signify. Likewise, anything from a rock to the color red can be signified by non-seeing. So, infinite names don't signify anything determinate. They only determine what is not signified, and therefore they don't properly fall within the definition of a word, but they could be called words by analogy. Having now discussed words, we can begin to discuss speech, or in Latin, oratio. As we defined speech earlier, speech is a conventionally significant vocal sound, some part of which signifies separately. The first kind of speech is imperfect or incomplete speech. This is speech that in itself does not perfect the mind or put the mind at rest. This includes phrases and dependent clauses. Here are some examples. Just man. If I were a rich man. Jack and Susan and. Notice that with each of these examples, our mind is left uneasy. It's not put at rest. We're expecting something more. When we hear just man, we want to know something about the just man. When we hear if I were a rich man, we want to know what follows next. What's the consequent? When we hear Jack and Susan and, we're waiting to hear some third person, some third person's name. Opposed to imperfect speech is perfect speech, or complete speech. This is speech that perfects the mind and puts it at rest. In order to understand this kind of speech, we need to understand that there are two activities of the mind which can put, be put at rest. The first activity belongs to the intellect. It's the activity of knowledge. The goal of the intellect is truth by means of the activity of knowledge. 
The second activity of the mind is love. Now, love pertains to the will. The will aims to attain some good by means of the activity of love. So the intellect aims at truth, and the will aims at the good. Now, the first kind of perfect speech, or the first kind of speech that puts the mind at rest, is enunciative speech. Enunciative speech pertains to the intellect only. Enunciative speech is defined as speech in which there is truth or falsehood. Other names for enunciative speech are declarative sentence, enunciation, proposition, and assertion. These names can be used more or less interchangeably, although there are subtle differences between their meanings. Enunciative speech, or an enunciation, signifies a conception of the intellect absolutely, without reference to the will. In contrast to enunciative speech is ordering speech. This is speech that signifies the intellect relatively, as ordered by the will to some end. The first kind of ordering speech is a request. Request is subdivided into requests made to an inferior, that is, to someone who's subject to your authority, and requests made to a superior, namely someone who's not subject to your authority. A request, in general, is a speech signifying the intellect ordering another to act or to do something. In an imperative request, is one that orders an inferior, and a deprecative request is one that orders a superior. An example of an imperative request is, do this. An example of a deprecative request is, please do this, or would you do this? Prayers are also examples of deprecative requests. So ordering speech is first divided into request, and second divided into interrogative speech. Interrogative speech is a kind of ordering speech which signifies the intellect ordering another not to do something or some action, but instead to answer with his or her voice. Here are some examples of interrogative speech. Is it raining outside? Where is the TPS report I sent you? Both of these are questions. Interrogative speech is essentially just questions. The third kind of ordering speech is vocative speech. This is the most difficult kind of speech to understand, or of perfect speech to understand. Vocative speech is speech signifying the intellect ordering another to attend with their mind. Here are some examples. Hey you, hello y'all. So ordering speech is subdivided into request, interrogative, and vocative. A request orders somebody to act or to do something. Interrogative speech orders somebody to answer with their voice. And vocative speech orders somebody to attend with their mind. All of these are said to be perfect speech because they give the will something which it desires, or, in other words, they result from the will desiring some good and wanting to order the external world by means of speech. So in a request, the will, through the intellect, orders someone to act. That's the good loved or desired by the will. With interrogative speech, the will desires to hear a voice answering a question. With vocative speech, the will desires the person who's spoken to merely to attend with their mind. In each case, there's something the will desires, and the will orders the intellect to produce a sentence or a speech. And that speech is aimed at attaining the thing that the will desires. Ordering speech in general does not signify the intellect absolutely, as should now be clear, but instead it signifies the intellect 
as subject to the movement of the will towards some good or something desired. Let's summarize. There are five kinds of perfect speech. We have enunciative speech, imperative speech, deprecative speech, interrogative speech, and vocative speech. The one of most interest to us in this book and in this video is enunciative speech. That's because we're doing logic in order to benefit science or philosophy. But since science and philosophy are concerned with truth, the sort of speech with which they are most concerned is enunciative speech, in which there is truth or falsehood. The other four kinds of speech, or of perfect speech, are studied not by philosophy or logic, but instead by rhetoric and poetry, which are both liberal arts. Oh,